heresies that we're going to jump into in chapter 2 uh, are fascinating to me because it really goes right into the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That wonderful upcoming uh, thousand years of Christ ruling and reigning on planet Earth, on the throne of David, uh, and uh, that's going to happen right at the end of the tribulation. So it's interesting that uh, Isaiah gives this prophecy and he kind of like jumps right over us uh, from where he is, all the way to the very time when Christ returns and sets up his kingdom. It's interesting. We'll be there with Christ, resurrected bodies. Won't that be nice? Huh? Amen. None of you will recognize me because I'll have a full head of <laughs> dark, wavy. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just going to be a glorious time. I, I mean, as believers, that should set our hearts right, you know? Uh, a lot of folks, you know, maybe in a hard place in life, think, what do I have to look forward to? Oh my goodness, you have Jesus Christ to look forward to in all of eternity, you know. So we got plenty to look forward to. Uh, these verses go hand in hand then with the book of Revelation. So I know that you'll see that. Uh, Isaiah, through this book, is going to give us quite a range of prophecies. It, it seems to me like... Uh, some years back, maybe we're talking, uh, you know, 25, 30, 40 years back now, the church was very much into prophecy. And, you know, uh, that was really a big topic in the churches. And I think that was a good thing. And, and if you really understand the Word of God as you're studying it, it ends up that about 25% uh, of the Bible on average is a prophetic verse, something yet to come. So... Uh, it's there, uh, and the Lord has given it to us, calling it the sure word of prophecy. And he uses that terminology so that we can know uh, that the word of God is trustworthy. And so uh, I love it that we're in this book. He goes from uh, things that are happening in his time to things that will just happen very shortly uh, from where he is at this time. And then he also goes to the time of Christ's birth and Jesus' ministry, and he gives great insights into that. He is, uh, it's almost as though he is a news reporter standing at the cross uh, as he gives to us Isaiah chapter 53 and what the Lord shows him, um, and all the way to the return of Christ. It's, it's really quite a remarkable book in so many ways. Uh, Let's get right into it then, shall we? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, gave concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It starts very much like chapter 1, doesn't it? Now, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. So it's almost like, uh, you know, this is like a gun going off at a track meet. He doesn't give any introduction, he just goes BAM! Now, you look at a verse like this, and just from observing the text, you look at this and you go, something remarkable apparently is going to happen to Jerusalem. Something remarkable is going to happen uh, where the Lord builds his temple. Now there's going to be a temple that's going to be built there uh, during uh, the tribulation period that lasts seven years of judgment before Christ returns. However, that temple ends up to be more almost like the Antichrist temple is what it ends up being. So that's taken out of the way. And when Jesus comes back, he puts a temple there. And uh, I think that's the temple that this is referring to in the place that it's referring to. So something amazing is going to happen in Jerusalem. We have not seen it, so we know that this is yet to come. And by the look of things and the way that the world is moving and wanting apparently to move so rapidly away from the things of God, it can't be very short, very far away. Now Isaiah has told us uh, here and in the first chapter that these are things concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So the prophecy is that Jerusalem will be a kind of world capital. That's what I see here. With nations coming to it, 
to learn about Jesus and to give homage to him. Who are these people? Because time and time again, you'll see they come, they do this, they say this. Who the they are in this is important because these are the they that survive uh, the uh, Great Tribulation. And uh, there will be a few people left, not very many, but Jesus said unless those days were short, there would be no flesh left on earth. And so, <clears throat> remarkably, it's the last three and a half years of the tribulation that are so uh, amazing and uh, give such opportunity from the Lord for people to repent. <clears throat> but this section here uh, reminds me of Psalm 2, if you remember that one. But let me just give you a couple of verses. Psalm 2, verses 10, 11, and 12. It says, Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, and that refers to worship of Jesus. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. That's how Psalm 2 ends, and it just, you can see how this goes together. Verse 3 says, many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. So this would be Jerusalem. To the house of the God of Jacob. That's talking about the temple Jesus will put there. And it's talking about the God of Jacob. That would be the nation of Israel. He will teach us his way. Can you just imagine the possibility of going to a Bible study with Jesus doing the teaching. That's just amazing to me. Now we know that when Jesus had his three-year earthly ministry, when he was in Jerusalem, he would teach on the temple grounds, the area that was called Solomon's Porch. And so I, I, I'm stunned at the prospect. I'm stunned at what this is saying. And we shall walk in his paths, that's so we're going to follow the word of God. For out of the people that are on earth are going to. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So you can almost see Jesus is kind of a, you know the Old Testament judges? You know they had all those judges? And they would, they were there and they, they were used by the Lord to disseminate his word to his people. Well, in this case, it's almost as though like Jesus is one of the judges and that it's a judge of the whole earth, though. This interesting picture. Now, let me give you a verse out of Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11, where it's, it's talking about the, the time when Christ reigns. And it says, None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord? For all shall know me, this is the Lord speaking, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawlessness and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. There are so many awesome, amazing, wonderful things coming our way that we'll be able to experience in the Lord. Verse 4 says, he shall judge between nations. So apparently, during the millennial reign of Christ, the nations will still be separate and they'll still have their territories. And shall rebuke many people. It's going to be a time when you don't want to get out of line. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This verse can be found in, uh, in New York uh, on the uh, building that the United Nations has. Isn't that cool? I would say, based on many of the decisions that come out of the United Nations, they have no clue what this verse means. But what is it saying here is, well, okay, think of it absolutely zero, positively, no wars 
at all whatsoever. No disputes at all whatsoever between nations, between states, between neighborhoods, between people. It's going to be just an incredible time. So there's apparently going to be a great deal of army surplus available. <laughs> so you'll be talking to your neighbor. Uh, apparently we're going to, it's going to be far more agrarian society uh, than it is at this time. And uh, you say to your neighbor, hey, I don't know if you catch my new, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm going to plant some corn in the back 40 here, and I'm going to plow that field with this. Oh, yeah, I've got a, a tank that I got out of all my surplus. <laughs> and, uh, somebody's going to say, well, look at all those bayonets you have. What do you use those for? Oh, I use those to prune the trees and everything. It's just going to be really amazing. Zero wars. Uh, you know what this tells me? Uh, Jesus really is the king of peace. Where Jesus is ruling and reigning, where Jesus today in our hearts has the proper place, then what he brings is peace. There should be a definite difference between the believer who has Jesus ruling and reigning in their heart and the rest of the world. Uh, I think that I've heard a number of testimonies from fo folks. I've experienced it myself where some tragedy comes along or some difficulty comes along. And the Christian, you know, we feel it. We're not like cruising through it. But oftentimes, at the most difficult times, there is a presence, a gifted presence of God that allows you to have a peace that other people notice. And that peace, you need to know, comes directly from you giving the Lordship, the throne of your heart over to Christ, because wherever He shows up, as we see here, he is the king of peace. In fact, Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, so often we go, oh my goodness, what about this? And, what about that? And how are we going to resolve the other? And I don't know what's going to happen. But for us to have Jesus as our great peace uh, is just beautiful. Dwight Moody said the following, A great many people are trying to make peace, but that has already been done. God has not left it for us to do. All we have to do is to enter into it. Sometimes that's tough in the middle of some tragedy, how or something going crazy. It's like, okay, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you then you have to connect with him. So all right, now we look into Christ judging the world. So it's kind of interesting how how he did this. You cannot expect the Bible to kind of go along like you know one chapter after another chronologically. We've noticed that it doesn't work that way. Have you guys noticed that? The Bible does not work in that fashion. Instead, and especially in the case where somebody's being given a vision, we see it with Isaiah. Micah is the same way. We see it with Ezekiel. We see it with a John, the Revelator. But it's like, I have no clue what kind of vision these guys experience. But uh, I try to imagine it. So I'm thinking, does anybody remember Disneyland had this thing called America the Beautiful? Oh, and it had nine screens that completely surround you, right? And uh, it was pretty cool. Do you guys remember it? No, okay. No. It was nine screens, <laughs> and it was called America the Beautiful, and it was like 360, you know, kind of a thing. And you would just like, wow. You could see it 100 times, and you would not see the same thing every time. So. In my line of thinking, because if you ask some people about America the Beautiful, though, they would say, oh, well, did you see the part where, you know, uh, they're in San Francisco and, and whatever happened? They go, no, 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 I didn't see that part. You know, I saw this other part where they were in New Orleans, and, you know, I was paying attention to that. So I kind of think that these guys are shown this uh, 
this uh, vision, and it's just before them like that. And then they're like, <laughs> and they're like, well, I, I see the, the birth of Christ. You know, they, oh, oh, Bethlehem, you know, uh, you know, and they go, what? The cross. Who's that on the cross? And, you know, just this whole thing. And then when they lay it out, they, they lay it out to us. It's like, it's almost like uh, they see it in three-dimensional and we're like two-dimensional kind of a thing, you know. Or they see it in another dimension, you know, an eternal kind of dimension realm. And then they, they try to, like Paul the Apostle, remember he said, look, I don't know if I was in my body, I don't know if I was out of my body, I went to heaven. And then he goes, I would like to tell you what I saw, but I, I just can't, I can't do it. Almost like it was like overwhelming. It was so much that he couldn't do it. Well, Isaiah here in the first chapter says, I'm going to tell you this vision I had. And it almost seems to me like it reads like one vision. And then he writes it all down. And it's all these different screens that he's seen. And he starts here and he goes, here's the millennial reign of Christ. Oh, I see Jerusalem. Is not doesn't have any sin in it. Wow, what a picture. What's that? Oh, I see a temple there. Oh, wow. And people are coming from all over the world to the temple. Oh, that's awesome. That's the millennial reign. Then he looks over here, and it's almost like the prequel <laughs> to it. Before the millennial reign comes the tribulation. So he almost like takes a step back and he says, Wait, I'm looking at this screen over here. Let me tell you what I see here. And that's what he does uh, in uh, verse 5. He starts talking about the judgment of Christ before the millennial reign. Verse 5. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, I know that looks like a really small verse, but there is really a lot there. He's about to talk about the judgment. But he starts out by saying, O oh, house of Jacob. And you know that that's, that's code language. That's Bible language. House of Jacob. Because we know that Jacob uh, had a name change. Uh, Jacob was a little bit of a stinker. Uh, and he was a usurper. And he was always trying to be one up on everybody and uh, but he was also uh, you know from him progenitor you know uh, so uh, he got his name changed to Israel after he wrestled with Christ that night walked away with a limp and uh, he got his name changed to Israel which means governed by God so from a crafty guy to coming into a place where he would have to lean on God for everything. And sometimes the nation of Israel is called Israel. And sometimes the nation of Israel is called Jacob. So they're usually called Israel when they're doing good. And they're usually called Jacob when they're not doing good. So if Verse 5 starts out with, O house of Jacob. You know what it's like? It's like when I was a kid, and I was down the street messing around, and my mom would say, Paul, come in. And I would ignore her. And then 15 minutes later, she would go, Paul, Andrew, come in. And then if I would still stay out there, finally she would say, Paul, Andrew, Aguilar. <laughs> And then I would know I'm in trouble. So it's just like that here. He doesn't say, oh, my beloved, or oh, my wife, which in the Old Testament, Israel was the wife of God. He, the, the, this is not, this, you have to understand what he's saying when he goes, oh, house of Jacob. It's like, almost like tisk, tisk. Oh, house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. So that verse puts them in this place where they're like, you know, you could say, 
we're not house of Jacob, we're Israel, governed by God, but they're not acting as though they're governed by God. So that's the very first thing you see in verse 5. The next thing you see is, come let us walk in the light. So apparently they are not walking in the light. Come let us walk in the light of the Lord. They're using something else to govern their lives, and it's not the light of the Lord. Now we know that uh, in John chapter 1, in the Gospel of John chapter 1, we find out that John the Baptist, who John in his Gospel calls him more John the Witness, says that he has come to bear witness of the light. His dad, Zacharias, said he's going to bring a light to people who sit in darkness. So, how kind God is. Before he does, says anything about judgment, he says, come on, come walk with me. It's almost like you say, what I, what's going to follow this you're not going to like, let's just skip it all together. Let's just, it's like, how many times have you even thought to yourselves in your own walk with Christ, I've identified the enemy. It's me. And as I think of my life, the troubles that I've brought on my, life, my own life, don't you think of that? So every now and then, what? Oh my gosh, I brought that trouble on myself. God could easily have called me Jacob at that time. God could easily have said, come with me. I could have ignored him. I just think that verse 5 is awesome. <laughs> I like verse 5. I'd like to stay there. I'd like to say, okay, let's be obedient. But then look what happens next, starting in verse 6. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. So they're not paying attention to the Lord. They're looking at the world around them and they want to pull from what are other cultures doing that are not following God. You, Lord, have forsaken your people, the house of Judah, because they are filled with eastern ways. They have soothsayers like the Philistines. And they are pleased with the children of foreigners. And that doesn't mean children like that means the people. The people of foreigners. The picture here is one of a people who have God's word, who own his promises, who have been spared, who have been delivered and established. By the way, that's what God does to anybody who comes to him. He spares them, he delivers them from what's going on, and he establishes them in himself. And yet... They're pleased to worship other gods. They're pleased to entertain things that are not God. You know, the Bible says to uh, love that which is good and to hate that which is evil. You know, the whole thing is to develop and to come in such close connection with the Lord that you begin to develop his tastes for things. And you begin to develop his repulsion for things, you know. And then you also find out that he's a jealous God, meaning that he loves you so much that he is against anything that would take you away from him. That's our Lord. <laughs> their land is also full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. And their land is so full of horses. And there is no end to their chariots. This tells us right off the bat that they're in a prosperous place, and they definitely were. Right at the time when Isaiah first started preaching was one of the most prosperous times of uh, Israel, right next to the time when Solomon was in charge. Uh, they were very well off. They were doing really good. So this tells us that prosperity, as great as it is, financial prosperity, does not... Heal the heart. Uh, it does not equate to light. Uh, in fact, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, the Bible says. You start loving money, you are asking for trouble. You might want to call it the love of money is economic idolatry. Don't know if you've ever thought of it that way. Listen, God is not against money. 
uh, he would love for all of his people to come to the understanding that money is a great tool. That's all it is. Money is a great tool. It's not an end-all and be-all of itself. Use it for his glory. Tithe with it. Own it. Just don't let it own you. Verse 8 says their land is also full of idols. How could that happen? Isn't this uh, God's people? How could they have the land full of It says full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. Look how great we are. Look how mighty we are. Look what we've done. That which their own fingers have made. Doesn't Romans chapter 1 talk about that? Romans says they worship the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. We are, we are a worshiping people. That's how God made us. Every single person ever born is a worshiper. And unless we're worshiping the one true God, we will worship, you know, we'll worship all kinds of crazy things, right? <laughs> uh, drug, sex, and rock and roll, and cars, and football teams, and singers, and we'll make American idols, and, you know, political people. We'll just, we will look for something to worship. Uh, and verse 8 says, People bow down. This is in, in, in Israel. People are bowing down. And each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. What this is saying is they're, they're bowing down before their own false gods. And they're bowing down and humbling themselves to their own uh, misunderstanding of who God is. Therefore, that is such an affront to God that, that they won't be forgiven for that. Exodus 20 verse 4 says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that's on earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth, to worship it. That's pretty clear. And that's from Moses, from the Lord, from Moses in the Ten Commandments. So, the listing of these things are really a list of things and a list of way of living that are all things that take us away from God. That's really what the heart of this is. And as I've mentioned a number of times before, each one of us has to come to a place where we make these decisions about what it is that makes, that keeps me right with God. And what things have I fallen to, or like Pastor Mike would say, what snakes have bit me that would pull me away from the Lord, right? So I need to make a conscious decision. How do I stay right with God? And then when things come along, that I go, I would weigh them that way. Will this bring me closer in my relationship with Christ, or will this take me further away? And I weigh things by that, and keep the good, and pitch the bad. <clears throat> Verse 10 says, enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. Is that, is that at all sound familiar? That's, that's almost like right out of the book of Revelation. Uh, when God brings his wrath, in fact, let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 6, which is uh, 6.15 says, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains. And they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? So when God brings judgment, People just are running from it. Look at verse 11. The proud, that's the lofty, the lofty, it's talking about pride. Looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. That tells us that each one of us needs to take a humble place. Uh, not too long ago, maybe about a year ago or so, I ended up getting this long conversation with the fellow. I, boy, he was all gung-ho. He was like, man, I want to serve God. And, 
and I want to get, I really want to, you know, and I realized that as he was talking, there was a whole lot of, you know, I, me, my, I'm gonna, I want to, I, you know, and does anyone remember, like, the originator of pride? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> that was Satan. And what did he say? I. I will ascend to the high. I will be worshipped. I will. And uh, that was it for him, right? And uh, Jesus said he saw him fall like a lightning bolt to earth. But so as I talked to him, I, I said, you know, bro, uh, I said, I hope you don't mind me telling you this, but I think that you should try to be nameless and faceless and let God do what he's going to do. Give God room to do what God wants to do. Don't be telling him what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. That's going to be difficult on you, bro. Just instead, go to this humble place before God. I think that's what the Lord wants from us. That's exactly what's going to happen here. Uh, if there's one thing the Lord hates, it's pride. It cuts us off from Him and from receiving from Him. It negates His correction and His guidance. Pride is such an incredible blinding influence in our lives. You don't want it. It is the fruit and it is the root of of every sin. Verse 12 says, For the day of the Lord. Now, this is the first time we have the mention of the term the day of the Lord. See it? There in verse 12. The day of the Lord is not talking about a particular day. Uh, the meaning is more like this. Uh, to this point, it's been man's day. You know, like saying to somebody, you've been in charge of your life. How do you like it so far? And because uh, it's been your day. But the Lord's day is when the Lord steps in and takes over. So really that would encompass and is going to encompass primarily the last three and a half years of the tribulation and then into the, the judgment, both the judgment seat of Christ and also the white throne judgment for those who do not receive the Lord and then uh, the millennial reign and then going forward. So it's been the day of man, we're gonna get to the day of the Lord. But for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up. Everything everybody praises and glorifies. Oh, that's so awesome. That's so wonderful. Upon every high tower, upon every fortified wall, upon every ship of Tarshish, upon all the beautiful sloops. Another translation says crafts. The loftiness, the pride of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord will be exalted in that day. Let me read to you from Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 16. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Number one on the list, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, Feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. That's God's hit list right there. Verse 18 says, But the idols he shall utterly abolish. They're going to be wiped out, vanished, no more idols anywhere. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. Another translation says, into the caves of dust, from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty, when He arises and shakes the earth mightily. So this is the tribulation period right here. 
Someone has said that just a little bit of God's wrath does an amazing job on pride. <laughs> and I believe that's true. Kind of like saying there's no atheists in foxholes. Verse 20 says, In that day man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made for a maid, each for himself to worship to the moles and the bats. Just throw it in the dirt. Toss them out. Verse 21 to go to the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the, of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty when He arises to shake the earth mightily. You do realize everything's going to be shaken, right? Everything is going to be mightily shaken. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 26. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now He has promised, saying, Yet, once more, I shall shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve the Lord acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. <laughs> so some things are stable and some things are going to shake. Hang on to the, those things that are solid. Verse 22 says, serve. Sever. Excuse me, sever. Another translation uses the word cease, same kind of thing. Cease or sever yourselves from man, yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? Now, I want to get this to you in two different ways. First of all, since we're talking about the tribulation, this could very well be a reference to the Antichrist. Just don't serve that guy, don't get near him. They have nothing to do with him. only thing that guy has is the breath in his nostrils. In a larger sense, this is all of us. This is all of us in the sense that why do we listen to what other nations are doing that are apart from God, other people that are doing that are apart from God? Why do we pay attention to that? Why are we so uh, in need of the acceptance of the world uh, rather than enjoying the fellowship of God? is the picture that's being given here. Because all we really have, and all any person really has, is the breath that's in their nostrils. Now, uh, breath is something that is given to us by God. Isn't that how Adam formed out of the dust, God breathed into him, he became a living being. So, in the same way, God gives us our breath. It's a powerful statement, too, to say, for of what account is he? I could put this another way. Who are you going to trust, man or God? Doesn't the Bible say, let, let God be true and everyone else considered a liar? Okay, let's, I'm going to, I'm, we're going to do this. I say in chapter 3, you ready? For behold, the Lord of hosts takes away from Jerusalem and Judah the stock and the store. This is what he's going to remove from them. No supplies. The whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water. No bread, no water. We know that this happened uh, when the Babylonian captivity came. This is, he's now, so he went from uh, the millennial reign of Christ, uh, stepped back to the, to the uh, tribulation period and the day of the Lord, and now he's jumped back to where he is in his time frame, talking to his people right then of something that will very shortly happen. The mighty man and the men of war, the judges and the prophets and the diviners and the elders. So everybody's going to be taken away. The captain of 50 and the honorable men, the counselors, the skillful artisans, and the expert enchanters. It wasn't everybody just bagged up and taken away to uh, Babylon? This is what happened. I will give children to be their princes and babes shall rule over them. So they were really second class citizens in every regard when it came to captivity of Babylon. They were chained and locked and roped together and marched off. 
The people will be oppressed, every one by another and every one of his neighbors. The child will be uh, insolent towards the elder and the base towards the honorable. You know, when I stopped and looked at that, I thought to myself, verse 5 here of chapter 3, that is a pronouncement of a judgment, right? This whole thing. But if you'll, if you'll kind of look closer at it, this is a lot like some of the stuff that we see happening in America. That, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, when we were kids, you could literally get your mouth washed out with soap by saying a cuss word. You know? I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> and not only that, but it was, you know, <laughs> this is a little hard, a little hard to explain if you're not in our age bracket, but uh, when we were kids, if you did something wrong, not only would you get in trouble with your parents, but also the neighbors could correct you. Other, other you know, because it was kind of like this, the right and wrong was still there. And it was understood, your behavior or how you acted. And there was a lot of respect always given uh, from children to adults. In fact, all the adult neighbors in my, in my neighborhood, I don't know what their, their first names were. Because it was, you would always call an adult Mr. or Mrs. and then whatever their name was. And uh, it was just a whole nother uh, ball of whack. And if I got in trouble from a neighbor, and then the neighbor told my folks, then I'd get in trouble from my folks too. <laughs> it's the way that it was. And in just such a short period of time, like one generation, we have seen this thing flip uh, upside down. I, okay, it is. It's way different now. I totally get it. I understand that. But uh, I'm shocked at sometimes at when I hear uh, some teenage kids talk to their parents. And I think, and I think to myself, <laughs> if I had talked that way to my dad, I would not be standing here today. <laughs> my dad would say, "I made one of you. I can make another." <laughs> You know, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> uh, but there was a, there was a civilness. There was a, you know, a respect. Uh, there was a respect. You know, that was that was just there. That just seems to evaporate, have evaporated. It, look at verse six. When a man takes hold of his brother in the house of his father, saying, uh, "You have clothes. You be the ruler." And, let these ruins be under your power. Hang on, I'll explain this. In the day he will protest, saying, I cannot cure your ills, for my house is neither food nor clothing, nor do make me a ruler of the people. What this is saying, and this is another judgment, it's saying that there will be qualified men that could be leaders, but they'll say, I'm not, forget it. I'm not going to do that. And so what are you left to? You're left to a generation coming up which will take leadership, but they have no respect or understanding, you know? This is interesting that God says this is a judgment because in many respects we see that happening now. Uh, I, you know, a lot of these people that the president has recently appointed, he's actually come out and said, I told him, you know, you, you may not want this appointment, because of how you're going to be scrutinized and lied about and written in the press. And, uh, there, are there are plenty of people who were going to take appointments and then they were like, no thanks. I don't want it. That's what this is talking about. Y you leave the Lord. Okay, if you leave the Lord, what's bound to happen? It's not going to be this upward spiral to paradise. It's always going to be a downward spiral. It's always going to go that way. Uh, verse 8 says, For Jerusalem stumbled and Judah has fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. I think, uh, I think just, was it like last night or something? There was an Emmy Awards. And, uh, one of the, uh, I saw a quick clip on the news and some 
actor got up there and he was just ripping Christians. Just. <laughs> and everybody's laughing. And I thought, see, when I hear that, I think, oh boy, that guy does not know what he's saying. He has no, you know, understanding. Why the viewership has dropped dramatically. Yeah, that's true too, yeah. Okay. So, uh, you could step back for a moment here, and again, first we saw the story, uh, so to speak, of the millennial reign of Christ, then we looked into the tribulation time, now we're looking at what's happening in his day, and to a large extent what's happening in our day. But uh, here's what you can take from the Word of God, that all the principles are the same. They repeat themselves, and some of the circumstances change. But the way that God deals with a nation, the, the way that God deals with the world is the way that God will deal with a nation, is the way that God will deal with a, with a country, is the way that God will deal with a state, is the way that God will deal with a neighborhood, is the way that God will deal with a family, is the way that God will deal with an individual. The principles are exactly the same. He always calls because he knows what happens to humanity that he created once it goes away from him. And he's always pleading with us, not don't go that way, don't do that, come this way. Come this way and there's peace. Come this way and there's joy. Come this way and there's meaning and fulfillment. Not only now in this little slice of time with this little you know, bit that we see, but I'm talking, God goes, I'm talking all of eternity where I will continually, over and over again, repeatedly show you my great love for you. Look at verse uh, 9. Let's finish this up. To look on their countenance, uh, witnesses against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their souls, for they have brought evil upon themselves. See, this is what God said. You're, you're going to do it to yourself. Now, today is a day of parading your sins. Uh, again, things just a few short years ago, which would never have been mentioned, not even spoken about in mixed company, uh, are now openly being taught to our children. Uh, it's easier to speak in a school if you're a witch than if you're a pastor. It's easier to speak to children about sexual habits than the truth that God loves them and they're special to Him. It's easier to lead a chant than to lead a prayer. God help us. Here's the flip side though. In the middle of all this trouble, God says to you and says to me, verse 10, say to the righteous, we're not righteous because we're so great, we're just following Jesus. Amen? Amen. To the right, say to the righteous that it shall be well with them. God's message to you is it's going to be well with you for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. In other words, we know that our works do not save us. Salvation is a free gift, but our works follow us and become our reward. <coughs> works do not save us but works follow us, just as, verse 11, woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with them, for the reward of his hands shall be given to him. He's got nothing else to stand on but his rewards for what he's done, and all that he's done from his hand has been apart from God, and so it's not going to go good. So these two verses kind of say, pick your reward. Verse 10 or verse 11. Verse 12, as for my people, the children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, those who lead you cause you error and destroy the way of your paths. The Lord stands up to plead and stands to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of his people and the princes. You have eaten up the vineyard. The vineyard refers to uh, Israel and plunder the poor is in your house. God is always a defender of the poor. That you mean by crushing the people and grinding the faces of the poor, says the Lord God of hosts. Moreover, the Lord says, again, a direct quote, God speaking. 
Because the daughter of Zion are haughty, that's pride, and walk with outstretched necks and wanton eyes, walking in, walking in, mincing as they go, making a jingle with jingling with their feet. That's just pure pride picture right there. Therefore the Lord will strike with a scab and the crown of his head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will uncover their secret hearts. The Lord has a way of exposing things, doesn't he? In that day the Lord will take away the finery of the jingling anklets and the scarves and the crescents and the pendants and the bracelets and the veils and the headdresses, the leg ornaments and the headbands, the perfume boxes, the charms, the rings, the nose jewelry, the festive apparel and the mantles and the outer garments and the purses and the mirrors and the fine linen, turbans and the robes. See, what this is saying is, it's saying that women have gotten to a place, God's equal opportunity corrector, <laughs> so he's talking about the men, now he's talking about the women, and he says, you guys are into how you look, how you smell, and what kind of purse you have. Look, you see, things never change, do they? You know? Uh, you're taking selfies all the time. <laughs> That's what this is saying. The Lord's going, I'm going to take all that away, the fine linen, the turbans, the robes, and so it shall be, Instead of sweet smell, there will be a stench. Instead of sash, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, baldness. Instead of rich robes, a grinding of sackcloth. And a branding instead of beauty. Your men shall fall by the sword. And your mighty in the war. Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she shall be desolate and shall sit on the ground. Wow. Wow. They were so uh, caught up. Okay, again, we talked about all the things that take you away from the Lord, and you need to pay attention to those. So the things that take you away from the Lord are all the things that are mentioned here. And... They were so much looking at them, and if you spend time looking at these things that take you away from the Lord, the result is blindness. In other words, you're unable to see your spiritual nakedness. That's what happens. And then they led into captivity. And that's what happens to us. <laughs> we can get easily schnookered and led into captivity into our own sins and held captive by them and that which we thought was going to be beautiful and lovely. What do we say? Uh, you know, sin always takes you further than you thought you would go. It always keeps you longer than you thought it would keep you. And it always costs you more than you thought it would cost you. Right? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight and for loving us and for giving us this strong word. We know, Lord God, that you are a consuming fire. No doubt about it, Lord, we understand that. We also know that you're a loving Father. And Father, through this book, we see not only your strong judgment, but we see your incredible mercy continually calling us to come and to be with you and to walk in the light. I pray, Father, that you would help us to be those that walk in the light. Father, we have no power to overcome these things of our own. So Father, help us. Form us and shape us and help us by the power of your spirit. Father, we're clinging to your word that says that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Bless my brothers as they go, and my sisters as they go. I pray this in Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. Amen.